Good day, everybody. My name is Thomas Burke, and we just concluded our joint ESL and ASLD special conference on hepatitis C. And the conference was entitled New Perspectives on Hepatitis C, the Roadmap for Cure. With me are Professor Nora Terreau from the University of California in San Francisco. Welcome. And Professor Raymond Chang from Mass General Hospital from Boston. So, welcome. Thank you. And we, together with Xavier Fons, were the organizers of this meeting. And I have to say, we had really a very interesting and lively discussion. And I think it clearly turned out that, that we have now the weapons to treat hepatitis C. This does not necessarily mean that everything is solved. And we face that there are a lot of challenges. So, Nora, what do you think was most impressive for you during the conference? Well, I actually was impressed by the global presence here, that um, there was a, I think, this sense that HCV elimination is now something we can talk about. The WHO has put it on the map as, you know, the goal for 2030. And there was a lot of discussion about what that really means to achieve elimination and, and what do, how do we define it. Um, and I really enjoyed the, the discussions about really looking at where hepatitis C is in different parts of the world, recognizing that we have many gaps in both uh, our knowledge about the epidemiology of hepatitis C in certain parts of the world, and then looking at the care cascade along the way in each of those countries and how it's going to differ in each of those places. But, but it, it was more than that. It was more that each country has sort of specific problems, but we can sort of learn from each country. And I think the, the areas, for example, that I found most interesting was the discussion about healthcare-associated infections and how that's the biggest disease burden globally and how strides to really improve healthcare um, and the safety of the blood supply, et cetera, were key to actually getting reductions in infection. And then the two other big groups that we discussed a lot at the meeting were the uh, persons who inject drugs. That is being a very big population across many of the countries and how we're going to deal with that group of individuals. Uh, and the other group that I think we spent you know, uh, time on was the, the uh, HIV and men who have sex with men. And the, the reason those kept coming back as kind of important groups were there was this emphasis, emphasis that the treatment alone wasn't going to solve the problem, right? And that's where we got into the issues of harm reduction, uh, prevention messaging, and the issue of um, the fact that we're going to see reinfections. We've got to be okay with that, that that's part of still the elimination strategy. Um, and I think there were some very insightful discussions about that and, and talks that were given at the meeting. So for me, understanding sort of how we're going to move towards elimination was actually very, I think, well done at the meeting. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And Ray, I think what was also quite nice during the meeting that we had this kind of a translational aspect, but also basic science aspect. And it turned out that we learned a lot in our development of the new drugs, the understanding of viral infection. And one can say that in a way, hepatitis C virus is a teacher, absolutely. also for clinical basic science, epidemiology. Epidemiology. A absolutely. Uh, I think we, we learned uh, two things as we considered the, uh, the, the, the story that got us to this uh, uh, very successful scientific uh, uh, vantage point. Uh, we learned certainly the story of, of how we got here um, as, as uh, from the, the discovery of the virus uh, to methods to cultivate uh, the virus successfully. And that proved, of course, instrumental for the development of these profoundly uh, effective small molecules that are now part of clinical practice. But we also learned that the virus is more than just a virus. It interacts with its host in a profound and myriad number of ways. Uh, those ways include disruption of um, a number of pathways, signaling pathways, and even metabolism pathways. It, uh, the lipid uh, biosynthesis pathways, we've learned that it hijacks that for its own purposes. We learned that it, that it disrupts insulin signaling and uh, glucose metabolism, leading to increased risk for diabetes. And we particularly learned that it is, is very responsible uh, for uh, increasing the risk for cell transformation in cancer. 
uh, through a variety of different means, not just inflammation and all the injury that it begets, but just simply even induction of, of endogenous pathways like uh, epidermal growth factor uh, pathways to induce a growth program that ultimately may trigger cancer. That's important because of what we are seeing in the aftermath of cure. In the, in the aftermath of cure, we're still seeing some not complete elimination of downstream risk, but a reduction. So there's still a residual number of people at risk for transformation to a malignancy. So that has prompted, I think, a, a great deal of, of in, introspection by all of us saying, we're not done yet. This is a disease as much as it, is, as it is an infection, and that disease isn't done yet. We've got to find ways to understand why uh, the virus moves on or the, the infection state and the liver disease it produces uh, still can lead downstream to um, uh, a set of, of uh, still very important complications. And, and I think to that um, uh, extent, uh, further investigation understand, uh, as we learned a little bit uh, uh, over the course of this conference, that there are programs that are still affected even after the infection is eliminated. Um, a number of gene expression programs and possibly even epigenetic programs that are induced that don't fully reverse. And so understanding that's going to go a long way toward identifying people who are still going to be at risk for these continued complications of their, of their disease. Yeah. yeah, indeed. I think that's a very important point and we have to learn a lot what happened after our eradication. I think we had excellent presentations on standard of care, what is the state of the art, how to treat patients with all the different genotypes in the standard situation. And it could be nicely discussed on the background of the new guidelines. The ASLD had a new guideline. Yesterday, the ESL guideline was released. Um, but we also discussed special patient population, the problem of resistance, um, transplant patient, kidney patient. So what was most impressive for you with these special populations? Is there something special you would like to address? Well, I, I, I think the, the one which, kind of came, again, um, came up many times during the conference was the patients that had cirrhosis and especially decompensated cirrhosis. And it links back to what you were speaking about, Ray, this whole reversibility issue. And when you cure an individual, do you really cure them and what does cure mean and, and how much recovery of, a, of, of the liver and the complications of liver disease do you see in somebody who's got decompensated disease? The whole management of a patient who's on the waiting list, that was a, a very kind of controversial issue, I would say, that we had many opinions about who to treat on the list and who not. And I thought there was good insights into how to think about that problem and the fact that we need more data in that regard. Um, and I thought the discussion about acute hepatitis C was also very interesting. Um, you know, a kind of a new dimension for us to be thinking about therapeutics where we, because the ESO guideline did come out with some new in, new recommendations, and that kind of was the a focal point for us to discuss acute hepatitis C. Yeah. And uh, Ray, what do you think about the, the issue of DAA treatment and any risk of hepatocellular carcinoma? You know, there is the issue whether there's any link If you put the immune pressure from the virus, then hepatocellular carcinoma may occur or that is a, come back more that, easily. Absolutely. That, so there is, uh, you allude to a series of, of, of very interesting reports in the aftermath of, of, uh, of antiviral cure with the direct acting agents where uh, increased uh, frequency and incidence of hepatocellular carcinomas, either recurrent HCCs in patients who've had them resected or de novo HCCs in persons who've never had them, uh, occurring in that first year or so uh, after the cure is, is achieved uh, in, in, in frequencies that, that seem to um, clearly stand out against the backdrop of what we used to see with interferon-based therapy. So the question is provoked, is there something different or unique about a DAA-obtained cure compared to our previous uh, approaches? Uh, it, it begs some certain mechanistic questions, to be sure, Uh, in terms of asking, uh, is there something about the immune response against C uh, that may have held uh, uh, nascent or early tumor cells in check, uh, if you will, uh, that upon elimination um, with the DAAs, uh, we're now seeing uh, a release of those cells and then eventual 
manifestation, um, where we didn't see it with interferon because perhaps interferon had prolonged anti-proliferative uh, effects uh, for some time. That's an intriguing hypothesis, but it needs to be explored. Um, quite another approach might be asking, uh, as we saw in an, another presentation, uh, looking at immune responses um, uh, being liberated in the context of, of DAAs in, in, in terms of the virus being eliminated and its uh, net uh, suppressive effect on T cell responses being essentially uh, removed, are we seeing uh, uh, new T cell responses that at some level are actually contributing to that transformative event? So it could be a number of possibilities that need to be explored, but, but these reports certainly uh, give us caution about saying, we better have a firm handle on who these patients are and what the, we think their risk for cancer is in general. So if they're high risk for cancer in general, uh, we need to think carefully about, about the intensity of, of, of how we monitor them uh, thereafter. When listening to all these talks, I had really the impression that we have not much experience now with the direct antivirals. It's just there around for two years and before we had decades dealing with interferon. And even if we have one regimen, the next one is coming and probably we are a bit overwhelmed or probably exhausted <laughs> like the immune system by all these different and new regimens and haven't had the time really to think about what could be the next step. And I had a feeling that there is a place, let's say, for the response-guided treatment. It could be that baseline resistant testing, other things may play a role, but at least if the drugs remain expensive, very expensive but expensive, there can be a chance to have four, six, eight, twelve, a kind of tailored treatment duration, and there's a lot to explore, but I think at this stage we need a kind of a a stable situation with the regimen, not one regimen following after the other really to deal with, how can we have a more individualized treatment? So do you have the same feeling that we will start into again an individualized regimen in the future when everything is, let's say, settled? Or will it be one fits all? Probably Nora, well, if you'd like yeah. to. Yeah. I think it's going to vary by country. It's going to vary within regions of countries, of countries. But the the whole striving at the moment for the one pill once a day that's sort of applicable to every patient is really to simplify the regimens that can then be broadly applied across large populations and hopefully at low cost so they can be given to large numbers of individuals. And I still think that's going to be an important goal in, you know. Uh, countries that have lower resources and 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 less specialist um, capacity in Europe, in the U.S., where we're more interested in cost and cost um, control in a way, then uh, the, we're going to be more interested in shorter duration, like being more efficient in how we're doing the treatment, and therefore the individualized therapy may have a, a bigger role. So I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we'll see potentially both evolve. Yeah, I think that um, that uh, globally speaking, uh, to have a one-size-fits-all uh, standardized regimen may be high priority here, um, particularly with regards to uh, not ju not just uh, defining a simple pangenotypic regimen, uh, but one that requires uh, the utmost minimum of monitoring, uh, because I think one of the um, you know major capacity issues is probably going to be the ability to, to monitor these patients. So I suspect that what we'll be seeing is is looking for that regimen that allows a minimum of fuss, a minimum of of of, of you know careful safety monitoring. And and we and we know that from this meeting that there are many regimens that could potentially fill that role of being once a day pangenotypic and and could could um, you know be that 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 candidate. But as Nora said, I mean, I think that the idea of tailoring things um, where, um, where we can um, uh, may make some sense, but, but, I, but, I, but I do get the feeling that, you know, with highly tolerable agents, whether one goes six weeks, eight weeks, or, or even something less, um, uh, is maybe, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, 
working around the margins here because I, I, I suspect that, that it's, it's more important just to find the patients and get them treated than it is to find the customization um, uh, for that particular patient um, because that may involve work, may involve work in terms of uh, defining some, some uh, yeah. additional characteristics. I was going to ask your thoughts about that as well, Thomas, I, especially because one of the emphasis that we heard when we heard the DAA failure discussion was, if, you know, do your first, reg, first treatment regimen and do it well to sort of minimize the chance that you have a treatment failure and then you're having to deal with DAA resistance. So do you think that that's going to influence on this kind of movement towards short duration therapy where potentially risk for a DAA failure may be higher? I'm clearly in favor of having starting with a regimen where you have, let's say, a 100% likelihood of cure. I think it's not appropriate to start with something suboptimal. But I think the point that was quite clearly made that we're probably over-treating 70 to 80% of our patients is also true. And if we had better markers, more experience right. with the regimen, then it will turn out it may work. And it actually already worked because we were all afraid in shortening treatment duration to eight weeks, but now we have these large-scale studies showing in real world it works and we are comfortable to reduce. And I think eight weeks is not the benchmark <laughs> we can't go below. Yeah. Um, probably one point we would like to discuss, and this is this access to treatment, let's say in, also in high-income countries, and the role of screening, risk adapted screening. And I think for the moment, this is still frustrating. And I think there's a really a broad field of improvement and research, how to find the target population. What's your impression here? I, I think there was a very, uh, a really wonderfully done talk where they looked at screening in different countries and, and the idea of when, in the US, we use baby boomer screening, but in many other countries, they're also using baby boomer screening as kind of this kind of um, opportunity to capture as many people who are infected as possible, but, but not exclusively. And the role has to be baby boomer screening plus risk factors, and that's appropriate for the US because that's our epidemiology where most of our individuals were infected back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and we still have new infections evolving related to sort of the epidemic of heroin use in the United States. Um, so I think the emphasis is you have to know your own epidemiology and base your screening strategies on that. And I think that was really well, well presented. And, um, and it highlighted the need to have your epidemiological data so you can do that. Um, and then to really tailor your screening to your own epidemiology. But you make uh, the excellent point is that we're doing a, a not a very, it, most countries are not doing a very good job of screening. <laughs> that even though we may have the target populations, that we still have difficulty in actually executing the screening strategies. Mm -hmm. And so that is in the care cascade where we have our, a very large gap right now. And until we fix that gap, that's going to remain kind of the, our biggest barrier to having this goal of elimination. And that came through in many of the talks, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it, the, 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 the top rung of that cascade is uh, we're, we're not even getting people up to that top rung. And that's, and that's a, a, a most unfortunate situation, uh, especially given the fact that, that um, organizations um, have endorsed in the United States, for instance, baby boomer screening. It's now, uh, it is now reimbursable for primary care uh, providers to do it. In fact, it's, you know, it's, it's actually part of uh, really quality of care uh, metrics yet. And we yet, have to partner with the general practitioners. That's right. And that's something probably new for us when doing research yes. that yes. we have to do this. Well, I think I would like to thank you. We had really a very interesting meeting and I would like to invite you to join into the meeting. You can do this via the liver tree. You can log in and you see the whole presentation. So thank you very much, Nora. Thank you very much, Ray. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.